Hello, everyone, and good evening. Welcome to the Dr. Penny L. Hamrick Doctoral Student Colloquium. Um, we're so grateful that you can be here with us this evening. And next, I would like to turn it over to our faculty moderator, Dr. Chris Wright. Good evening, and welcome to the School of Education, Dr. Penny L. Hamrick Doctoral Student Colloquium Series presentation. I am Christopher Wright, and I'm here to, um, and I'm going to be the faculty moderator for this evening. We are so pleased to welcome all of our virtual attendees, including School of Education, uh, faculty, staff, and students, and the student body at large, and community members and partner associations, among others. The colloquium series offers School of Education doctoral students and alumni an opportunity to share their original research and learn from their peers, faculty, and staff. Each month, one EDD and one PhD student presents their research at the colloquium. These sessions help doctoral students to connect with each other and develop a peer community that is invaluable in supporting their journeys in the program. Each doctoral student or alumni presenter is also asked to write a research brief that relates to their presentation, which is then included in an edited publication titled Doctoral Student Research Briefs, published on the School of Education's website. The resource brief is a way to disseminate our doctoral students' research as shared in the colloquium in a concise format with relevance to education. Each presenter this evening will be provided with 20 minutes to share their research. We will then move on to questions and answers following each presentation. Please save your questions for the end. You are welcome to type your questions in the chat area of Zoom or use your mic to ask questions at that time. So next, I would like to um, introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker um, tonight is Trefina Hooper, who is a second year part-time PhD student in the School of Education. She is a neurodivergent, first generation academic, and devoted mother of two. Trefina has a bachelor's degree in history with minors in gender and women's studies, and Japanese from Usinus College. She's a licensed attorney who obtained her JD and Master of Public Health degrees from Drexel University and currently serves as the Executive Director of Drexel's, Drexel's Privacy Program Services Department and Deputy Privacy Officer. Her scholarship leverages a rich blend of legal expertise, public health insights, disability rights advocacy through embodied Black feminists, methodologies. Trefina strives to foster educational environments that allow all students to be fully present, fully human, and fully embraced by their community. So today, the title of Trefina's presentation is From Segregation to Disproportionality, Discrete Contributions to Understanding Special Education's Legal and Historical Dimensions. I'm going to turn it over to Trefina. Thank you, Dr. Wright. I'm trying, I'll sh share my screen at this point. You think I'd be an expert at Zoom, but I am not. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Trefina Hooper. Um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, so today I'm presenting on a scoping literature review I conducted to explore how a particular theoretical framework called discrete could could and has been used to explore a topic of interest to me, which is the disproportionate overrepresentation of Black students in special education. So I just wanted to give a bit of an agenda. What we're going to cover is about you know the foundational law uh, surrounding the provision of special education services. We're going to define disproportionality and work through the lineage of disproportionality, looking through the history and the legal context. Um, just some of the terms are, are archaic and are now considered offensive. And so to the extent possible, I avoid using them, but just understand sometimes I don't fully have a choice if it's the name of the law, it might be in there. So just in, by way of introduction, um, we are familiar with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It's the law that makes a free appropriate public education to eligible students available. Um, it was passed in 1975 as the Education of Handicapped Children Act. 
Um, and as you can see, it's been reauthor reauthorized a couple of times. It's got, got a lot of revisions. So this is not a law that was written and forgotten about, but it's constantly being reviewed and changed and updated. And as I started on my scholarly journey, I began to think more concretely about this piece that the department revised uh, regs as late as 2016 with the goal of promoting equity. And so uh, a law that exists for the purposes of providing access, of providing equity, as access to a civil right, I thought it was interesting that the literature was demonstrating that historically um, disproportionality has, racial, racial disproportionality has always existed within uh, the determination of disability and special education services. And how even by 2016, we're still having the same conversation about what to do about overrepresentation and underrepresentation of certain racial groups within special education. Um, just as way of explanation, and of course, this is a very uh, outsized example of what disproportionality can look like. Um, it generally refers to this concept of overrepresentation, where as far as probability is concerned, there's way more folks of a certain race within a certain category than would make sense off of the base level statistics. Um, essentially, it's the exceeding our expectations for the group in terms of how they're represented. Um, and so Black students in special education um, they've, they have a complex history of intersecting oppressions. Um, this book, Why Are So Many Minority Students in Special Education? It used to be called Why Are So Many Black Students in Special Education? Um, but over time, the exploration of disproportionality has changed and incorporated more um, racial demographics. But my interest for a variety of reasons is black students in special education because, as I mentioned, um, you know I have two kids, one of whom is twice exceptional, and so um, in my own personal journey, it became more salient to me to learn more about how special education has historically served or failed to serve students like my own. Um, in terms of identification, black students are forty percent more likely to be identified as having being a student with a disability than their peers. They're also more likely to be identified with intellectual disability or emotional disturbance than students with um, all other disabilities. Um, intellectual disability and emotional disturbance are considered high incidence and um, highly stigmatized uh, types of categories of disability and they are less favored and often subject to additional disciplinary action and, and whatnot. Um, Amongst Black students in special education, they're three times more likely to be educated in restricted settings, uh, separate and apart from their peers. They're often referred to as um, segregated settings. And in terms of disproportionality as far as school discipline goes, uh, Black students in special education are three times more likely to be expelled than all other students. And so um, I began thinking about this and reconceptualizing of disproportionality through the legal lens, because I found it very interesting that when, you know, 1954 gives us Brown v. Board of Education, we have the end of legal segregation on the basis of race. However, it would be another 21 years before the right to education was established, regardless of ability. And, um, as I was picking through the literature, I began to see this theme that after Brown, um, there were was a lot of vocal opposition to integration for a variety of reasons, but one that was resonant with me is this idea that black students were intellectually inferior and should in fact be placed in special schools so as not to disrupt the learning of white students. Um, all things told, disproportionality creates disparity. And so there is a multitude of um, scholars exploring this idea of outcomes and educational attainment and how they are affected and impacted by identification into special education. Um, the image that I selected is referring to the school to prison nexus. And in fact, uh, recent scholarship is suggestive or accepts 
the idea that special education can be a path within or parallel to the school to prison nexus, like essentially an on-ramp into disproportionate discipline, um, segregated and restricted settings, and ultimately like the justice system. So in terms of tracing the origin of disproportionality, I thought it was interesting to pick through the historic landscape. How did we concept, how do we as a society conceptualize of disability and who is disabled and what is the relationship between that identity and race? And so picking through the literature and thinking through how um, race and education and intelligence have been sort of intractably merged over time, we have the historic anti-literacy laws and you know threats of violence for folks who are trying to establish schools for Black people. We have scientific racism, um, you know, the belief that Black people's biological and physiological way of being is inherently inferior. Um, one such example is this concept of drapedomania, which was the pathologization of Black people's desire to not be slaves. Um, which sort of feeds into this medical model of disability, phrenology and whatnot, just saying that the physical differences are bad and indicative of inferiority. And then also thinking about what the universe looked like before and after Brown and this urge to preserve schools for white folks and, and uh, good education for folks who are viewed as normal and this definition of what is normal and how it is sort of implicitly raced and focused on ability, perceived ability more so. Um, and in terms of trying to find a way to frame out the historical and the legal context of disproportionality, I naturally kind of turned to critical theories. And what I was noticing is exactly what the authors of Discrit noticed, which is critical race theory engages with this social construction of identity very explicitly, but does not engage with the intersection and the intersection of identity with disabilities. And it doesn't engage with the fact that different disabilities carry different meaning and that it, when constructed for certain people, certain races, certain genders, the impact is going to be different. And then in terms of disability studies, I was seeing there was a similar engagement with the social construction of ability and disability, but it wasn't um, engaging with the intersection of race and how that affects the outcomes. But discrit kind of fills in these margins and um, it has a lot of tenants, it has seven. Um, while they're not all required to be present and accounted for in order to use the framework, just in a general broad strokes, um, it covers a lot of the ground of this intersection between critical race theory and discrit, um, specifically around the idea that racism and ableism are inter interdependent, they rely on each other, they influence each other. Um, multidimensional identities, because none of us have a singular identity. We are all multifaceted, multidimensional people who are experiencing the world through those lenses and those intersections. Um, the social construction of race and ability, not um, indicating that there's no such thing as a physical difference or a racial difference, biological difference, but the meaning of those things is socially constructed and the impact that they have on people who are so identified has a social construction to it, um, then the more traditional, you know, critical theoretical uh, tenet of centering marginalized voices. Um, and point five is the one that I was very interested in that it can discredit specifically considers the legal, ideological and historical aspects of disability and race and how they've both been used separately and together to deny the rights of some citizens. And it also retreads the ground of critical race theory about and adds ability to it, like whiteness as property, interest convergence. Um, and so I kind of naturally bumped into discredit while I was trying to learn more about disproportionality. And I appreciated that it specifically engaged with the historical, social, and political interests that inform 
the construction of identity and how systemic ableism and racism influence what we see um, in various levels of society. So my methodology for the scoping literature review is, is started with a central question about how has discrete been used to explore the historical and legal development of special education? The touchstone text being, you know, discrete. I wanted to see how it's been used. Discrete came out in 2013. And um, I was interested to see across the major academic databases who's really using it and what are they using it for? And is anybody trying to use it the way that I would like to? Um, in terms of search terms, I use special education, which was very broad. Um, Brown v. Board of Education, which I think was a uh, heuristic for folks who were looking at the, the development of the of civil rights through the lens of the legal frameworks and due process. Um, special education and history, disproportionality, which was also very broad, and Park v. Commonwealth, which is another um, salient watershed kind of case that influenced the flow and the development of special education. Um, in my initial search of the citations to disparate, um, the seminal text, it was about 600, 640 articles. Um, and naturally there's limitations to everything. I'm just one person. Um, I didn't have a group to sift through or a team. So for me, my inclusion criteria were using discrete as a conceptual or analytical frame, um, sub substantive engagement with the historical development of special education and specific engagement around the intersections of race and ability. Um, my exclusion criteria were anything that was outside of the United States. I didn't include dissertations, though there have certainly been uh, some in very recent years between 2023 and 2024. I've been seeing more uh, folks picking up discrete and using it for their dissertations. Um, I wasn't interested in articles that lacked substantive engagement with discrete. Discrete gets a lot of citations. Um, for the purposes of the point about race and um, ability being intersecting and interdependent. And I tended to, uh, I tried to avoid to the extent possible uh, pieces that were specific to the school to prison nexus, because um, as it has grown and developed, it's begun to take in special education as part of it. And I was interested to see uh, folks who were engaging with it outside of that specific frame. Um, and the elephant in the room is I did not engage with articles or did not include articles that were arguing about whether or not disproportionality exists. Um, this paper, it was, was and is very popular and um, initiated a sort of tidal wave of engagement around the idea that maybe disproportionality doesn't exist and maybe we don't have enough black kids in special education. So I wasn't engaged with that specific argumentation. Um, in terms of findings, I ended up where somewhere in the neighborhood of 19 articles and I found commonalities across. Um, Discord has moved in new directions at the behest of the authors. Um, I noticed it being taken up through these lenses of special education as a kind of structural violence, how special education plays into youth incarceration and abolition and again, school to prison nexus work. So pulling those aside um, and looking specifically for engagement around legal history and how we move from Brown v. Board of Education to the IDEA, I found that legal history is kind of limited um, in the ed research. It's a brief touch point, but it's not the specific subject of engagement. Um, I also noticed that discussions of special education tend to be segregated um, to journals that are about special education specifically. Um, and also that usually where I would expect to see disparate or where disparate is being cited, uh, critical race theory is often doing the heavy lifting of explaining the idea of the relationship between race and ability. But what I have found is there's a more interdisciplinary uptake of, of the theory. It's trying to move more um, outside of the realm of education and educational theory alone and to be taken up elsewhere, but it, it's still um, not over on the legal side yet. And I've seen some alternatives to discrete that have grown and evolved from it. Think concepts like racecraft or critical disability intersectional qualitative approaches 
that are meant to fill in more of the gaps that Discrit was trying to situate itself within. And with that in mind, uh, once I finished sifting through the lit and seeing that I wasn't seeing what I was wondering, which is how did we move from Brown v. Board of Education in 1954 to the Education of Handicapped Children Act in 1975? We've got about like 21 years of case law and jurisprudence that leads us to this point, but very rarely is it engaged with. And um, keeping in mind that one of the tenants, tenant five, of discrete is about considering the legal and historical aspects of disability and how both have been used separately and together to deny the rights of some citizens. It made me think about the historic touch point of resistance to integration and what that might look like. Um, and then also I was thinking about this 1972 congressional investigation into the provision of education at, to children with disabilities and how it said, 8 million children with handicapping, out of 8 million children with handicapping conditions, um, something like 4.25 million of them were not getting an adequate education. And then I began to wonder, well, why did they do that investigation then? And then I thought again of Discret's uh, tenant six about interest convergence that very often progress or progress is not possible without this interest convergence with uh, white middle-class citizens. So I was trying to piece that together. Um, thinking through the lens of discrete, and I want to, I wish I had more time because I think it's really interesting to be in a school of education in Pennsylvania when Pennsylvania is considered to be the birthplace of special education. And I'm going to tell you why. So in 1968, there was an expose on Pennhurst. Pennhurst was an institution. Um, children with disabilities were not allowed to go to school unless the parents are paying for it. Uh, personally, or they are submitting them for institutionalization that's paid for by the state, the Department of Welfare. And Pennhurst was um, an awful place and no student who attended there, they weren't students, they weren't receiving services at all. And um, the, I think it was like NBC Channel 10, Bill Baldini did this uh, expose. And so it became part of the cultural conversation about students with disabilities, children with disabilities, where are they going and what are they being provided? And so the uh, watershed moment in this conversation becomes this uh, class action lawsuit brought in Pennsylvania, um, Park v. Commonwealth of PA, and it was brought by the Public Interest Law Center of Philadelphia. Um, they're still around. They're at 17th and Ben Franklin Parkway. Um, a bunch of parents sued the state for the right for their children to go to school. These students, these children had not been allowed to attend school. Two of them were residents of Pennhurst actually, and they had been denied an education. And so from Penn, the, from Park v. Commonwealth of PA, we get the language of the due process process in special education. We also get the right to participate so that parents could participate in the education of their children. Um, and the other, photo I have is from the Mills case. Mills was also decided in the same year as Park. It's 1972. And Mills focused on the District of Columbia's practice of suspending, expelling, and excluding students with disabilities due to the cost of educating them. So these decisions in conjunction with each other and like 27 others triggered congressional scrutiny to assess the state of public education for students with disabilities. And seeing the salience of these issues in Congress's determination that something needed to be done, um, something specific to parents shouldn't have to sue to assure uh, education for their child and also resistance to institutionalization. And they specified that it's costing billions of dollars um, to institutionalize children who are being denied access to an education and they're not being provided with any ability to um, take care of themselves. And so from there, we see this interest convergence that while special education could and was um, used after Brown to continue segregating black students, keeping them out of the public school system, we also eventually hit this moment where the cost of restricting and segregating students by ability was hurting white parents too. And so 
the review of this, the determination ended up being like there needs to be a law. And so a law was created. But what naturally came with it was at the start of the right to special education was this disproportionality. And it has never gone away. Um, so when I think about the implications for future research, I think about the ways that discrete could be used um, in an interdisciplinary way. Um, and that special education involves understanding and engaging with legal scholarship, historical scholarship, sociology, po and political inquiry to understand where we've been so we can figure out where we're going. Um, I did have some questions. Obviously, they don't need to be run through, but I was curious to see if anybody had any um, specific areas of interest within special education that discrete lens could reveal new insights or um, methods that might be of interest for this. So Trafina, real quick, are, uh, are you finished with the presentation as my question? Okay, um, great. Um, so at this time, I want to open this up and we'll be take questions that you might have for Trafina. And again, you can, um, if you would like to, you can type into the chat um, any questions that you might have, or you can unmute your microphone and ask yourself. Hey, Trafina. Um, I have a quick question, and I think it kind of goes along with your first question. Um, by the way, lovely presentation um, in an area that is truly needed. We're, let's say we're all stakeholders in the room. Where do we take this information and start making changes to this system that you pointed out has been kind of evolving, but not really evolving? That's a good question about, you know, from theory to praxis and what does that look like? Honestly, I think honest and open conversation about these patterns and more specifically the idea of, well, what is a disability? When you, it, and it, are we seeing this across the board? Is this your interpretation um, of a child's behavior? Because we often see this pathologization of developmentally appropriate behavior in black kids and like kind of a, a hyper vigilance with them. And I think pushing on that could be a step in the correct direction towards correcting. Um, Cause I am a firm believer in if you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going. So if we can't look at our past, we can't hope to change the future. Thank you. Oh, Trippian, there's one, uh, another question in the chat in, uh, from Monet Harbison. It asks, why do you think there is a lack of engagement with discrete? Um, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't be sure. I mean, I think that sometimes folks think critical race theory can do the lift of explaining disproportionality. Um, that is just all regular, regular racism. But I think that there is a difficulty or a challenge with the social model of disability, just like with the social model of race and it, folks are uncomfortable with it um, and not really sure what to do with it once they have it. So I'm, I'm interested to see how it will continue to develop and it's already kind of growing um, beyond what those seven tenets are and I you know for gender and for sexuality and all of that and I welcome that I think it's a really good development but as far as why discrete hasn't made it over onto the legal side I don't know and I think it should um another question from the chat um says, considering your background in legal studies, do you plan to use discrete to do a policy analysis of any of the iterations of IDEA? If so, which iterations do you think you would be most interested in exploring and why? Um, 
In terms of my personal scholarship, I did consider kind of a discourse analysis or a policy analysis. I am specifically interested in um, IDEA 2004 because I am really interested in um, categories and the identification of disability and um, how it has shifted over time and how it's defined and how it's tested for. I could spend a lifetime of study just in that alone. And I find it really fascinating um, how we decide what disability a student has and what that means. And I think we have time for one more question, which is another one in the chat. Um, excellent job, Trifina. This is from Soraya Hudson. I learned so much from your presentation. Do you see this theory being applied to higher education and the way students with differing abilities are treated in colleges and universities? Um, absolutely. It was, um, I saw that a couple of times and uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but I do think it's very interesting to see it in uh, the higher ed context, specifically because we know the IDEA doesn't go through um, college, we're talking, you know, the ADA and Section 504 at that point. And so it is interesting to see how do folks who had an identification in elementary and high school when they move to the higher ed, what does that look like for them? How is that identity constructed? And for those of us who were undiagnosed throughout our entire school career, but became diagnosed in a higher educational setting, structure, program, what does that look like? Um, and I've I've been seeing that, and I think it's um, definitely rife for inquiry, especially because anytime we think of things as being neutral, but we come to these programs and whatnot as multifaceted individuals, and so we are all constructed differently depending on what our backgrounds and experiences and abilities are. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if discredit kind of continues to flourish there in terms of this um, exploration of, of higher education, especially as we think about intellectual ability and our perception of what is what smartness is and what is normal. So again, thank you, Trifina, for the presentation and for um, and for the answers um, to the questions at the end there. Very um, engaging presentation and we very much appreciate your time this evening. Our second speaker um, for today is John Hammond, who is a proud Drexel alum. He completed his EDD in June of 2023 and currently serves as the Chief Analytics and Insights Officer at Montgomery College, where he oversees institutional research and helps senior leaders make sense of internal and external data. John has been at Montgomery College since 2006 previously serving as a professor of mathematics, as well as both chair and dean of the mathematics, statistics, and data science area. Prior to joining MC, John taught mathematics at Anne Arundel Community College. John also served as a, as a facilitator for the Charles A. Dana Center, helping multiple statewide systems implement co-requisite math pathways. In 2011, he won the Montgomery College Outstanding Service Award. And in 2012, he was recognized by a NISOD Excellence Award and as the Maryland Professor of the Year. He currently serves as a holistic student support coach with Achieving the Dream to help community colleges better support student parents and as a consultant to help institutions optimize their course scheduling practices. He has been an invited speaker at multiple events across the country and loves talking about data to anyone who, who is willing to listen. The title of John's presentation tonight is A Mixed Methods Approach to the Effectiveness of Co-Requisite Developmental Mathematics Classes. So we welcome John. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wright. I, I, I need to start out with uh, just a little bit of gratitude here, here tonight, right? So, so let me... You know, thank uh, uh, Dr. Hill and, and the team for the invitation and, and Dr. Wright for, for moderating. Um, but uh, I need to give a, a, a big shout out to, to everyone for, for taking the time to, tonight and uh, especially to, to, to Dr. Klein, right, who, who helped me through this this whole process. Like, uh, you know, 
cheerleading where necessary and nudging where necessary. I mean, a lot of you might remember there was, you know, a big COVID, you know, issue that, that a lot of us had to deal with during, during the last couple of years. But uh, even bigger than that, some of us had to deal with, you know, multi-institutional IRBs, right? So there's some, several big obstacles that we, we had to get, get through. Um, but uh, in addition to, to my appreciation, I also want to start with a, a quick apology. As Dr. Wright said, I, I, I'm a data guy, right? So you're going to see a lot of numbers here, not painfully so, but there'll be quite a few numbers and uh, not a lot of good graphics. Like they're just boring slides with numbers, but we'll, we'll, we'll get through it all. Um, so I want to just give a little bit of, of, of my background, right? So I taught developmental math at, at multiple uh, community colleges, which were kind of an issue. Like we saw a lot of students who just kind of dropped out. Uh, a lot of times they often had, had high grades. Um, and I don't know, about a decade or, or maybe 15 years ago, like I'm getting older, um, I incorporated like a major redesign to kind of fix this issue. Like I really thought that if we just changed the curriculum, it would 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 fix everything. Well, you may not be surprised to know that that didn't fix anything. Right? The the issue with attention um, persisted. Success rates were about the same. And I started to realize that classroom pedagogy was not the issue, and therefore changing the pedagogy wasn't gonna gonna fix anything. Right? The issues with development of classes were really systematic and, and needed a more kind of policy level approach if we're gonna have, have any impact on, on students. So before I get too far into this, I wanna just take a minute to define some of the terms of what I'm gonna use. Like, so I talked a little bit about developmental education. And what I mean by that are, you know, of course they're designed to prepare post-secondary uh, students who are deemed underprepared for college level coursework. But these are college course off, co courses that offered at colleges but they earn no credit. Like, so a student doesn't advance towards a degree, right? So it's basically making them redo material that was supposed to be uh, mastered in, in high school. What I really want to focus on is two different types of developmental coursework, right? The first one is kind of the, the old style traditional developmental coursework. Um, and that's courses that begin with an initial assessment in developmental education and end with the completion of the highest level developmental course. Um, and this is kind of the, the you know, High bar is the phrase I'm going to use for these courses. Like students have to prove that they know this stuff before we let them see the cool stuff, right? So a lot of you, right, you know, might be familiar with this idea of math, right? You have to prove you know some base level stuff before you get any access to, to the more advanced uh, material. That's compared to the co-requisite approach, which is designed so that, you know, students can uh, place directly into college of a course and we can help kind of correct some of those, those uh, deficits along the way, right? So I wanted to compare between these two types of developmental courses, what kind of impacts they had, had on students. So in addition to the kind of the low persistent rates, which I mentioned in the developmental courses, many students that um, enrolled in these traditional developmental courses uh, were repeating the content they've already mastered and not er earning any college credit, which is a real motivational barrier. Secondly, these developmental classes, which were designed to help these unprepared students, became academic barrier, an emotional financial barrier, especially for those students that were, that were meant to, to, to help. Like, so they're well designed, but in the end, they had the opposite impact for, for what they're, they were designed for. And so the, the, the study of my you know, research was to really study the effectiveness of this co-requisite uh, developmental math course. Um, on success in the college level coursework, but also on the attitudes towards the content. And, and really the, the important part I got to is disaggregating by race ethnicity to understand for whom these courses were helping and for whom they were hurting. So I had three research questions. The first one is my qualitative question, right, where I'm really asking about students' attitudes towards college level mathematics and was the difference between these two different developmental um, um, pathways. The second two courses were, or second two questions were my uh, quantitative questions, where I really wanted to dig into kind of uh, uh, GPAs um, for for these students, um, not just in their math courses, but in their other courses that they were they were taking. And was there a difference between the two different uh, uh, developmental pathways? And we disaggregated that by race ethnicity to refine any differences. So there's just a few assumptions I make when I, I have these questions. You know, the the first one I think this is a a nice segue to, to what we heard from Trafina earlier, right, is that I'm walking into this with the assumption 
right? That you know all students in completed high school and in college are capable of learning the 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 developmental content, right? Regardless of race or background or social economic status, right? So that's an important uh, assumption. Um, we also, again, because of the COVID impacts, I, I had to assume that uh, you know the COVID didn't have any impacts. We know there's big impacts affecting people differently, right? Um, but we didn't have any way to to kind of account for that. And also, there was lots of instructional differences and um, minor differences in how the courses were taught. We had to just kind of assume were not the the, the main factors at, at at play here. So the the design of the study was to look at these questions: the the qualitative one at the top there, and the, the two quantitative ones at the the, the bottom. Um, and in this mixed method, we were doing uh, a convergent study, meaning that. I gathered all the data at once and were analyzing simultaneously to kind of come back together to, to merge results. And that was really helpful because as I was talking to the students and got informed you know, from discussions, it helped me look at the data differently um, and, and, and come back with some, some real good analysis from both parts of, of that mixed, me mixed method methodology. So a couple of quick things about the institution where I did this, this research, right? Uh, it was a, a large institution, about 17,000 students uh, uh, a year, a really diverse student body um, that was similar to its surrounding community. Um, the students had lots of multiple placement options. Like, so it wasn't just standardized testing. They could get placed based on uh, high school GPA. Um, they could use uh, multiple standardized tests and they could retest. Um, so there were lots of placement options. Um, and then the one thing to note is that a student's majors actually impacted whether they needed some of these developmental courses or not. So we paid attention to the course course majors. So when I looked at the students uh, uh, available, right, uh, when I looked back at the, the fall semester where I was gathering my, my data, I was pleased to see that the breakdown of race ethnicities um, was uh, that, you know, there's, Number of percentages of, of, of each, of course, not, not equal percentages. Um, but I had a total of over a thousand uh, uh, students that we could uh, look at, and they were evenly split. About half of those, roughly, were on co requisite uh, developmental, and about half were traditional um, developmental courses. When I looked at the, the quantitative, I had the same kind of group to, to, to pull from. Um, about 400 and, and, and 300 in the co-requisite traditional, um, and I was able to talk to, to 10 students out of out of, out of of each each cohort. For the focus groups, uh, I had, you know, eight questions here, they're kind of open-ended, but all eight of those questions come from uh, that ATMI, which I referenced here at the bottom of the slide, but I'll see again later. That's the Attitude Towards Mathematics Inventory, which was uh, a, a, a nice kind of survey question that had been developed years ago, and, and refined um, uh, many times, but it really got at what uh, students' attitudes towards mathematics was. So when I had these focus groups and I talked through these discussions, I found there's about 13 themes here, right? But uh, I don't get the two hours that I want to, to talk through these. So let me just limit this down to the six that I think are, 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 are most relevant here, right? So we saw themes of anxiety, right, where people came in and talked about how much trepidation and, and uh, kind of anxiety they felt about nervousness when they had to take a class. Um, that's going to map over to our ATMI uh, of a, of a self-confidence. Um, another phrase that I heard from both uh, groups was kind of enjoyment, like that they, you know, really enjoy the math now uh, based on their, their developmental experience. And that's going to map over to an ATMI category of, of enjoyment. Um, Frustration, right, is where they feel like they're working hard but not getting anywhere. Um, and that's going to map to our, our, our self-confidence. You may be surprised to hear this, but I talked to more than one student that actually hates math. Like, you know, hate's a strong word, but I heard it multiple times, right? You know, people who just flat out say, you know, I hate math. I hate it so much. I don't think it's necessary, especially for my career field and all this. So a lot of that, no, that maps to enjoyment as well, negatively to enjoyment, but but, but that category. Um, Satisfaction, um, where they talk about I found math really rewarding when I see the, the, that it adds up, right? So that idea that intrinsically, it's just, it's, it's, you know, the columns add up, it's nice, right? That, that's kind of the motivational piece we get from ATMI. And then uh, the last one is the usefulness, right? Um, what's it useful for? And 
in both categories, I found a surprise number of students who are just like, it's not useful for anything. I just got to pass this darn class so I can get on it and, and get my degree, right? So that, that gets mapped to, to the value. So when we actually started to use this ATMI for these students on this, this, this qualitative you know, portion, um, we saw you know kind of results here. If I look at just the first one, that enjoyment piece, I see very similar results, whether they're the corrected students or the traditional students. If I look at the motivation, I see, again, amazingly similar results, whether they're co-requisite or traditional. And if I skip to the value, again, I see really similar results between those, the, those two groups. The only real difference I see here is this SC, this self-confidence one. And um, I'll just tell you the self-confidence questions are all negatively worded, meaning like, I feel nervous when I come into a math class, or I feel that sense of trepidation, right? So that that high strongly or agree from the co-reps uh, uh, cohort means that they felt less confident um, than their uh, traditional uh, cohort peers. Other than that, we saw lots of lots of similarities. When we dug into the quantitative re results, we found something similar. And again, some of you may be really good at reading box plots, some of you not so much. The big takeaway from this is, if you look at these, all four of these look very similar. <laughs> That's the takeaway. They're the same. I can give you a whole bunch of numbers here in a minute. But what they ended up showing you is that there's no real difference here either. Right? So if we look at two semesters worth of, of students, right? So several thousand students worth of, of, of data here. When I look at, you know, the co-requisite versus the traditional, you know, uh, means on the, on the GPA, they are no significant difference. Overall, even if I disaggregate it, no differences. I look at the spring data, no differences overall, even when disaggregated. Um, and so, you know, as a researcher, there's some of that that was kind of disappointing. Like, of course, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dude that loves, you know, doing all sorts of statistical analysis. I love to see, oh, statistical differences here and there, right? And there wasn't any. But that's actually really important for this research, right? The fact that there's no statistical difference between these two approaches means that this approach where we say we don't have to have this so-called bar and make sure students you know pass this in order to, before it coming in is really kind of a lie, right? We can bring students in where they are, have just-in-time delivery methods where we can help students learn the material and they have the same success rates. Their attitudes are, 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 are quite similar. They may feel different, like they may feel I'm not ready for this, that self-confidence piece with some of these students saying, oh, well, I didn't prove that I could pass this bar, but they passed at the same rates, they passed their other course at the same rates. So that's a really important implication. I mentioned before about our majors, right? We don't allow these co courses, uh, not just at the institution that I was working at, but, but kind of across the country in non-STEM, or in STEM courses as much as we do in non-STEM courses. We really need to think about these pathways from more of our STEM courses. One of the reasons why we don't have the representation we need in STEM is because of these barriers that, that, that we put up. The placement practices um, is there's a rich literature and, and, and a lot of changing topics right now in how we place students to determine whether they're actually college ready or not um, at the community college level, but just even at the uh, a lot of uh, selective four-year institutions as you may know, if you've been paying attention to this, like how important are these you know, tests for admission and do we require SAT, ACTs, do we not? And, and as you know, there's been some big changes in that in a few years. And looking at the ability for those tests to actually predict success um, is worth looking at. Like we find that, that that predictive piece doesn't matter. Students who are allowed in, regardless of those scores, were able to do just as well as, as, as their peers. And then the last piece that I want to want to talk about here is uh, about uh, in, intrusive advising, right? Making sure that when we have these different pathways, even when I find no statistical differences, part of that has to do with who's choosing which pathway, right? Making sure that we have students who have a thoughtful conversation with people who are helping them choose which pathway they go down is really important to that student success piece. So the last thing I want to talk about here is just some, some future research, right? So um, one of the conversations that came up in, in, in my qualitative talk was a lot of students talked about dropping the class. And, and I mean that in terms of dropping in the, in the first window of the ad drop period that a lot of institutions have. 
when I started to dig into that data, even though it wasn't part of my original set of research questions, that's where I actually found some interesting um, um, uh, results on the dis disaggregation, right? I found that, that uh, our students of color were much more likely to drop some of these uh, uh, traditional classes and the co rugged classes because of kind of the attitude and stuff as they walked in, how that made them feel, right? So um, too often we only look at, at students who are officially enrolled in the class and, and stay, but some research into that add drop window and who feels a sense of belonging Right, which is which is a hot topic in higher ed right now, and sticks around is an important area of research. I think that um, another thing that we need to spend a little bit more time on is to think about uh, the structure of these co-rectorate classes. Lots of ways to to do them. Sometimes they have uh, co-rectorate students mixed with students who who did you know um, you know place via these assessment tests and all. Sometimes they have them segregated, right, where just co-rectorate students are by themselves. And looking to see what impact that has on students' attitudes and ability to succeed, I think is an important question and, and uh, would benefit from more research. And the last piece I want to talk about here is, you know, I know some of you may be just be interested in higher ed developmental math because, you know, that's something we all love. But uh, if you have a slightly broader perspective, though, to think about how do we handle students who come into a class with different amounts of learning from the previous class, that's something that's going to hit all of education. And that's even more important right now when we think about the learning loss that we know happened for some students during COVID. We have classes from, you know, kindergarten all the way through, you know, graduate school where we have students coming in not with the same expectations and, and the same experiences. So figuring out how we can effectively help those students learn the material they need in the course, even though they might not have proven that they learned the prerequisite material before they walked in the door, is something that we should all think about in, in, in terms of education. Um, I just had to quickly show my, my references, right, just to make sure no one thinks I'm, I'm, I'm not, not doing my due diligence here, right? Um, but then I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions if, if, if people have them. Thank you, John. So um, at this point, um, again, um, we'll take some questions and you can either type your question into the chat. Um, or you can unmute your mic and uh, ask the question yourself. John, I did have one question. Um, if, um, so have you been able to share any of your findings um, uh, with the institution, with from which, which you did the study X. I know that you mentioned about that some of the similarities and differences between students. Um, and so just, and then just, just wondering, um, you know, how they might have taken that information up if you were able to share with them. Yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. And, and, and I welcome questions. I will just take a, a, a quick moment here to say, I told some of my, my friends that this is nice. It's like a dissertation, but I don't mind the questions. Like a dissertation defense, I'm all, I'm all nervous about the questions, but this is a great conversation. So um, in terms of sharing this back, yes, I was able to share it back with the institution. And one of the things that they were able to do with this is to, to make some slight expansion of what their uh, uh, co-regular courses cover, right? Um, certain majors didn't have access to this um, because of just the way that they had, had, had structured this. And in particular, um, an area that's of, of interest to me is uh, teacher education. Um, because of, of uh, some agreements in, in, in the state, they had to prove that people who wanted to go into both secondary or even elementary education had kind of passed the bar, so to speak, to get into the, the college level classes. And so they were forced to do in that development, that traditional developmental role. Um, after looking at this research, they were able to decide that this really was um, uh, an acceptable way to get students up to that level. And so now our, our teacher education program has a co-requisite model which I think is, is really beneficial to those students. Well, it's great to hear that your work has some uh, uh, tangible outcomes that were able to be implemented at the school. So great to hear. Any other questions that anyone might have? John, this is Dr. Hill. Uh, congratulations again on a wonderful presentation and study and clearly has some impact at the institution. I'm curious if you are 
thinking about presentation or how you're expanding or, or sharing this work or uh, disseminating it? Yeah, so that's that, that's a good question, and and I will say a, a good nudge as well. Like, um, so uh, Dr. Khan and I have have talked about getting getting some of this uh, out there as as well. I mean, I really think that uh, what what is probably most interesting right now, and 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 the thing that that I think is probably going to get people interested the most is this idea of what I'm going to call sense of belonging. Like, who feels like they are capable of succeeding, and really looking at those students who first sign up for a course to see who sticks around is something that has been understudied kind of at two-year schools, at four-year schools. We didn't spend a lot of time looking at, at that data. And like I said, I was able to find some statistical differences amongst those, those students. So I would like to, to do a little bit more work on that kind of sense of belonging um, because we're all trying to figure out how to help students, especially first-generation students, students who might have some sense of, of not belonging when they first walk into an institution, to make sure that they can feel that 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 sense um, in the classroom. Excellent, thank you. I'm trying to get my teacher wait time here, so but um, I'm going to assume that there's um, no more questions. So. Um, I would like to thank our presenters for this evening, Trafina and John, for presenting today. Um, I would like to thank all of you for attending the colloquium event series, um, the 2023-24 uh, colloquium series will now uh, will now be available um, on the first Monday of the month from six uh, from 7:30 to 8:30. Um, the next colloquium event will be on Monday, April the first, and we hope to see you there also as well. So again, I thank you all for attending this evening and have a good evening.